Hey guys, and Merry Christmas everyone. I'm back with a long-awaited part four of the IGL series, and in this video we're going to be talking about all things utility usage. In this video, we're going to talk about how utility affects your economy, as well as basic usage and proper usage of each nade. We're also going to talk about how to condition teams and what conditioning means, and how to exchange your utility correctly. We will also mention my special rule of 12 that you will find nowhere else but on this channel. First, let's talk about the basics of your economy and how the utility will affect your economy. A smoke is going to cost $300, a flash is going to cost $200, but notably you can have two of them, so it'll cost $400 in total. A Molotov on the T side is going to cost $400, an incendiary on the CT side is going to cost $600, the HE grenade is going to cost $300, and the Lord decoy grenade is going to cost $50. On screen now you can see the two basic buying patterns where people will buy either a double flash or an HE grenade. You can also see that the T side economy is damaged significantly less than the CT side economy as far as buying utility usage. This means that CT side need to be very smart about how they utilize their utility and how they save utility because it's more costly to repurchase the utility later on. Now let's go through and discuss each grenade individually, starting with the bestest boy and the best grenade in the game, the decoy grenade. Just kidding. The decoy grenade is relatively useless and only serves a couple niche purposes. Its primary purpose is to make the sound of whatever your primary weapon is, or if you don't have a primary, your secondary weapon. So since I have an A1S equipped, it's going to make the sound of the A1S. Another thing that it can be utilized for is for gr faking grenades. For instance, if I come towards A and throw the decoy grenade as if it was a smoke, you might be able to trick your opponents by seeing the decoy grenade come in and they think that you're smoking, so they use a counter nade like a molly. It can also be used as a fake flash, however, it's kind of hard to do. The only way that you can use it is if you do underhand like this, because if you do a bounce, you'll notice that the sound is different. So I'm going to be quiet. You'll notice that the flash makes a slightly higher pitch sound than the decoy grenade, and you can't use it as a fake smoke either because the smoke sounds much fuller sounded. So as you can see there, the decoy is very, very high pitched in comparison. The one last niche use you can find for a decoy grenade is if you drop one right where you plant the bomb, and it explodes on somebody that has very low health, like this bot does, then it also is able to blow up and kill the bot. Next, we'll discuss the Molotov slash incendiary grenade. Molotovs are the only grenade in the game that can take things from 0 to 100 real quick. The premise behind Molotov is very simple. Fire is hot, don't stand in fire because fire will burn you. But what makes the Molotov and the incendiary so unique and makes it very different considering how simple the premise is, is that it interacts with the environment in very strange and unique ways. Because the spread is kind of inconsistent on Molotovs, it makes throwing set lineups very precise because if you're a couple pixels off, there's a chance that it won't spread the correct way. It's also good to know that Molotovs always spread from the center point of the molly. So as you can see here, it spreads outwards from the center, not from any of the edges. This is also good to know for the famous Molotov bugs where you try and smoke it. If you smoke a far edge, as you can see, that won't put out the molly. To smoke a Molotov correctly, you have to smoke in the center point, otherwise it won't put it out. So how do you use the Molotov and incendiary grenade? Well, it has three main purposes. First is to deny you area to stand. Second is to stall you on a push. Third is to do damage if you utilize them correctly. And then a final niche use to create some fake sneaky plays you can do with them. So let's go more into detail about each of the usages of the Molotov. The area denial is pretty simple. You want to utilize your molly in a way that is able to deny T and CT people from standing in places that are advantageous for them, such as mollying pit so they can't use any of the strong angles inside of here, or mollying into the cubby so you can gain control when taking banana. 
The second one is to stall. And stalling is one of those where it sounds very intuitive that I see utilized the wrong way very often. For instance, if you're the B-side anchor on Inferno and you have a Molotov and your job is to stall, you want to be playing in a spot where you can just hold the Molotov out for the most part because if they exec on you, you're not going to have time to pull out the molly and deal with the exec itself, right? So for instance, let's say I'm playing back here at new box or whatever. I'm just, let's say I'm just holding like a, a molly here, right? And then an exec comes in. I'm able to just bounce the molly and then I'm able to use my other nades to stay alive as well, right? So now not only can they not push because there's a molotov here, but I'm also able to utilize my other grenades or my teammates grenades to get into better positions for when that molotov fades. This can also be seen when CTs are taking banana control. If they smoke down here, you're not going to be able to help your teammate, right? Because he's in front of the smoke, you're behind it, running through it as a death trap. So one way that you can stall correctly is the Molotov car, and now they have to run through a Molotov, which they're not really going to want to do, and your teammate is going to be able to take an advantageous fight on somebody that has less health than them, theoretically. Where I see people messing this up though, is they think that just utilizing your nades to slow the other team down is a good idea. However, you're not really utilizing your nades in a way that has any purpose. So I'll see teams like smoke or molly behind the half wall, smoke deep, they'll nade into logs and they'll flash again. And yes, you've done the right thing by stalling because you're not really gonna wanna be in banana with all these nades being thrown. However, you haven't taken time into a effect at all. You haven't considered this factor to the round at all. The smoke and the Molotov are gonna be gone way before the round is over, right? The smoke lasts about 16, 17 seconds bottom banana, the Molotov by a half wall about seven to eight. And then once those are gone, you have nothing else left at B. So even though you've done the theoretically correct thing by stalling them, you've also hindered yourself late round. This is why you'll hear teams talk a lot about how to save nades, how to do things properly, because if you use so much nades early on, then you're really weak at the end round portion of the round. The next purpose of a Molotov is to do damage. However, most of the time, teams aren't really utilizing Molotovs in the proper way to get damage done. Don't get me wrong, you don't have to be doing massive damage with every Molotov you throw, whereas you probably want to do massive damage with every grenade that you throw. Molotovs have much more wide range purpose than just a grenade and just doing damage, as we've stated before. However, when teams do try and use the Molotov to do damage, I see it done poorly or wrong. Molotovs are best at doing damage when you pair them with other grenades. For instance, if there's a person hiding behind half wall here and you need to flush this guy out, you can easily just molly and then he can't stand there anymore, right? However, he's going to hear this molly bounce and he's just going to jump away and he'll maybe take 15, 20 damage. However, if you pair it with a flash from back here, where if he's standing here, he gets blind. Let's say he's holding, he gets blind or whatever. And then this molly lands while he's blind. Now he's in this molly, he doesn't really know the Molotov's there. He's blind, he can't see. And he'll take significantly more, if not die in the Molotov. Another example of this is if you're flushing people out of corners, like logs, you can easily get him out of logs by just mollying, right? And then he can't stand at logs at all. However, if you pair a molly with an HE grenade, then not only is he slowed down because of the HE grenade, but now he's standing in the Molotov and will probably die 100% of the time. The last use of the Molotov is to make some downright rat level plays. So behind certain barriers, Molotovs won't spread or do any damage. So as you can see here, I can pass freely and won't damage me at all. And therefore I won't make any noise that I'm taking damage. This is advantageous because on a T perspective, all you see is this Molotov landing and kind of blooming. So to me, that like tells me that Hut has been mollied, right? However, since the molly is behind this door and you can push with it, you can easily just run in, get a kill and leave, and there's no Molotov to do any damage to you at all. Next up, we have the HE grenade. 
Another thing you can do with grenades is what's called a grenade stack. And essentially what a grenade stack is, is you timing another grenade with a teammate that's going to land in the same spot and basically get an insta-kill if they're standing there. So as you can see, there's an upper CT holding to make sure that we don't push into banana or just walk up for free. However, what he doesn't know is that we've been practicing our nades on the offline server and are able to just insta-kill him. Where I see people go wrong with grenades is to take big gambles on nading something when you don't really have good or valuable information that they're there. For instance, a team that just Molotovs top car every round doesn't necessarily mean that they're in banana. However, I will see teams consistently utilize their nade either into logs or into the cubby without having any true idea if they're there or have any info that they're there. And this essentially just wastes $300 because you didn't get any usage out of that grenade. A much better usage of the grenade is to wait until you have a solid idea that they're taking control. My favorite place to use that, if we're taking Inferno as the example, is whenever teams smoke off arch and flash into bracket control, one really easy way to get damage is to bounce a grenade right here. So if they're coming out boiler, they're taking big nade damage from that. Or if they're on this back wall, which is typically how you peek for this guy, they will also take pretty significant damage from this nade. Now, that's not to say that nading something at random is a bad thing. However, you should weigh in the opportunity cost of doing such a thing. For instance, the example we took of nading logs, if you're going to do this, use two nades have your teammate nade as well why because if he's there you've used two nades and now he's going to die he just in he's instantly dead so you know that that area is clear now however if he's not there you're thinking well now i just wasted six hundred dollars instead of three but that actually isn't the case because you double naded it you now know for a fact he's not going to be in that spot right so you don't have to look there whenever you clear banana because you've already cleared it with your nades so while you did use six hundred dollars for no damage you were able to get information in return so again before talking about my own personal rule of 12 let's cover the grenade being utilized the proper way HEs are best utilized when you have information or are able to do chip damage at those times. So if they are, they flashed half wall or whatever and you think they're in car, throwing this nade, just bouncing it, if they're here, that's going to do damage to them and that's a good thing. Now, what is a good nade at that point though? Because technically if I just did one damage to that guy, I did do chip damage, I used the nades when I knew he was there, but that's not really valuable because you don't get much of a gain from only doing one damage with your HE grenade, right? So that's why I developed the rule of 12. And it's a pretty simple rule. If I shoot a terrorist, I'm going to do roughly about 90 damage, like 88 to 92. It really varies based off of distance. So I'm like really far away here. You can see I'm at 90. I back up even more. Let's see if I can get done like 89. Yeah, so as you can see, if I do roughly 12 damage with an HE grenade, I have an instant one shot to every terrorist that I face because <laughs> I've done grenade damage to him. He's a one shot now with my M4. Another thing, when you have an A4 and you spray somebody four times in the chest you will also be left with less than 12 health. So if you're utilizing the A4, this is a bit irrelevant now with the A1 because you have four body spray no matter what with the A1. But if you're still utilizing the A4, then you need to do 12 damage per nade and you spray four bullets to the chest then as well. That's actually really valuable because the A4 has a faster fire rate than the AK. So if you both started shooting at the exact same time, you would actually win the gunfight because of the faster fire rate. Next up, we're going to discuss the flashbang. The main use of a flashbang is to blind opponents and force people off of angles. However, what people often don't realize with flashes is that they are just as good at controlling space and preventing people from being in angles as a smoke or a molotov. The only difference is that a smoke and a molotov will last significantly longer than a flashbang will. So as you can see here, if we throw this flash, we're going to blind multiple angles that are 
very common for B players to play. CT, Coffin, and Behind the Pillar. This gives you a window of time where if an opera is here and you throw this nade, they won't be able to shoot you and will have to back away. Otherwise, you're just going to peek and kill him. So it's very good at controlling space. And people often think that it's just used in exex. What most people also don't realize is that there's two main types of flashes. There is the pop flash and there is what I like to call a void flash. So a void flash would be any flash that is essentially just thrown, right? So if we're here and we just throw something high like this, this is what I call a void flash because there's not a true set lineup for it to be thrown, right? A pop flash is a flash that is thrown from far away, has a set lineup, and has a set purpose. So this flash here is set up to specifically blind oppers that like to play this angle. However, if you're utilizing your nades correctly, void flashes should also be just as good. So this flash here, while it is effective, it does technically blind the opper, isn't that good. And what I like to use my void flashes for are essentially flashes that you cannot dodge no matter what. So bouncing flashes off walls like this, there's nothing that the opera can really do. Well, I, I guess that's a bad example. Let's do the, the more common one. Oppers that sit lane on boiler like this. One thing that Astralis started doing was bouncing flashes off of this wall. And there's no way for an opera to be able to turn from this flash. Even if they hear it coming, they can't like turn and then come back into the angle, right? So that's why I think void flashes are just as effective as pop flashes. Not to mention, Void flashes allow you to be in better positions most of the time. Because I don't have to be far back here to throw any sort of over the boiler flash like this, and I can just be closer to my teammates, it allows me to bounce a flash, go in and trade, instead of setting up a specific person to hopefully win their 1v1. One aspect of flashbangs that I often see people misusing is using too many. People really overvalue flashes because they're really good at what they do, not getting you killed by common angles. However, one thing that you need to realize is that they can't kill you in common angles if you kill them, right? If you're confident in your aim and being able to take gunfights, then you don't need to flash every single angle you approach. As well as if you're confident in taking gunfights, you can isolate one half the angles you need to fight. So for instance, bracket control, this is an area where I think that you want to be more quiet because you don't want to give the CTs that much information that you're in bracket. Because if they know you're in bracket, they can make more appropriate reads to how to approach the situation. So for me, one thing that I like to do is if I'm smoking off one side, I like to contact the other one. So for instance, I'll jiggle, I'll jiggle out this and then I'll just walk in with a teammate and clear these angles. While this does add more risk, and there's a higher chance that you die, it also allows you to take the space a lot quieter and makes teams a lot more unsure of where you're exactly at. Because if you smoke arch, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in bracket control yet, right? It just means that you're blocking one of the angle's vision. Finally, and the holy grail of utility, is the smoke grenade. The smoke grenade is the most versatile grenade in the game. However, it has a couple key usages that you'll see used just about every single match or every single round you play. First, it's used to block vision. This is the pretty obvious one. You don't want to give opponents very, very strong angles such as holding from CT spawn or holding from the headshot angle at coffins. So you'll often see both of these spots get smoked so you don't have to worry about them because they literally can't see you if they're in the smoke. The other very common way that you'll see smokes utilized is to delay. For instance, people will smoke off the lane here to where if you want to push through this lane, it makes it very, very risky because an opponent can be sitting behind it ready to kill you as soon as you come through. Smokes are very finicky in the fact that when you come through them, the opponent is going to be able to see you first before you can see them. So that makes smokes very hard to push through because anybody on the other side is naturally going to have the advantage in the fight over you if you're coming through the smoke. Honestly, a really good way to think about smoke grenades is looking at them as spammable walls. You know on certain maps there's walls that you can spam through. 
smokes in much the same way are essentially walls that you create in the middle of a round that you can spam through. For instance, if they smoke you off arch here, you can still shoot through the smoke and do full damage if they're pushing in. There's no problem with that. However, this has blocked the vision of arch entirely, right? So, again, I, a really good way to think about smoke grenades is as spammable walls that you get to build mid-round. Another common use for the smoke grenade is for area denial. For instance, you can deny people very advantageous spots by smoking it, such as pit here. So now if they're in pit, they can't play here at all because they can't really see anything. They're kind of just stuck here. So they can stay alive in pit, but they're not really gaining anything from being in this area of the map. This area denial can also be used to counter other area denial utility usages. For instance, mauling pit is very common, so you'll often see people use their smoke in this corner to put out the Molotov and allows them to still play in pit and hold. Smoke grenades are also very useful at doing a, a wide assortment of gimmick plays, specifically and most commonly one-way smokes that give you small gaps where you have a massive advantage on opponents that try and hold or clear the same angles as you. Where I see people go wrong most with smoke grenades is on the CT side. Most commonly, I'll see smoke grenades used without a true purpose or reason behind them. One of the areas where I think that is most seen is people smoking off mid just to slow them down from taking bracket control. However, most good teams are confident and able to take bracket control despite there being a smoke up due to their own grenade usage. So, saving your smoke for other purposes or having other ideas in case that they do come through is very important. Now let's take what we've learned so far and use it in a real round in a term that I like to call it utility exchange. Utility exchange is essentially the trading of utility back and forth between teams. And what you want to answer to know if you actually came out on top on a utility exchange is A, who used more utility, B, who came out with the advantage in the utility exchange, aka who used less utility, and then C, how can I come back from a disadvantage, aka I used more utility than they did. Utility usage is a very complicated idea because it changes between each team, each IGL, and each person's ideals. So for this video, I'm going to be talking about my own personal philosophy and how I give each grenade purpose. Purpose is a word that I've used multiple times in this video, but purpose to me is essentially having a reason behind using a nade, right? For you, it could be very different, and I highly encourage that you develop your own reasons or purpose to utilizing nades. For me, I like to utilize my utility in an exchange type of way, like an exchange rate, almost like the stock market, so that I always come out on top of the utility that I utilize. So a very common way for T's to take control of bracket is for them to smoke off arch, for them to molly lane right there so there can't be an opper, and then they'll do some combo flash. So either like a bounce flash with the barrel flash, whatever. This is fine, but you have to keep in mind that they're using four nades and they're 100% going to gain control of the area, right? You're not gonna really be able to contest this bracket control because of how much utility they are utilizing. So for me to win the utility exchange, I need my nades to not hold on to the control, but to make them getting the control difficult or damaging. So that's why, and this is a nade that I highlighted earlier on in the video, I'm a big fan of using this nade for when they do come into bracket control with all these nades, I've thrown one nade and I've done significant damage to them. In turn, if you're a team that likes to have your opper have an HE grenade, such as old Astralis, they would also like to bounce nades right here in much the same way. So you're essentially double nading this area and doing massive damage to them for taking bracket control. Another more common example for teams that don't have their opera have an HE grenade is once they're smoked off here to molly this area. Now if they're standing in the area ready to come into bracket control, not only are you able to do damage to them, but you're also able to slow them down. 
This isn't going to allow you to hold on to the control because as soon as that molly fades, the smoke at arch is still going to be up and you're not going to be able to hold on to the control. However, this molly does delay them enough for you to set up and accommodate for what they're going to do. Another example of utility exchange is when teams want to take arch control, they will often not smoke arch because then they have to wait behind their own smoke, right? So you'll more often see teams molly, maybe they'll molly under porch so you can't be there. They'll bounce the flash again and they will flash any opper off of arch with the barrel flash. Another very common and simple way of taking bracket control. So this uses three nades, two flashes and a molly, and it gives them bracket control relatively freely. However, they are taking more risk to do this. So if you're in a good setup in bracket, you do have the chance of holding. However, what you need to realize is their goal for using this bracket control, right? They are doing this so they can get arch control faster. So a really good util exchange for their three nades is to utilize your smoke to block off arch control. And using this smoke seems counterintuitive because this is what a T would do if they wanted bracket control, right? They would smoke this area. However, it serves a very valuable purpose in context of what the other team is doing. This utility exchange can get very complicated when you start to take into account how important map control is. For instance, banana is a very important part of the map, and this has changed a little bit nowadays, but about a year or two ago, if you didn't have control of banana, you were in big trouble, pretty much. So you would see some wild utility exchanges on this part of the map. For instance, the very common way that teams used to take banana is to smoke deep, have a close molly, have a deep molly, and then double nade logs or whatever. Not to mention, they will probably throw some sort of flash, whether that be bouncing one up behind you on the roof, having one just land behind the wall. There's going to be some sort of flash for them to utilize a lot of the time as well. So one flash, two nades, two molotovs, and a smoke. And then for T's, you'd often see they're going to uh, molly behind the car, they're going to jump in, they're going to smoke here, and then they're going to have two flashes from their perspective, right? They're gonna have like two of the window flashes. This is a very clear example of utility exchange. So with this molly up and this smoke up, the T's are winning the utility exchange because they've used four nades in comparison to the CT's five nades and they still have the map control, right? However, teams started to adapt more and more and that's where you're starting to see the meta come to now where teams will be more aggressive and utilize less utility, but force them into worse positions. One play that I specifically like from VP that they do with Yekandar is Yekandar will smoke deep, run and molly into this cubby, and then there will be a deep flash from a teammate. The standard fall and flash from here. Oh my goodness. The standard fall and flash from here. And then Yekandar will literally run down through the molly and try and kill anybody in banana. This uses three flashes and is a lot less resource intensive and you gain map control. Tees will still commonly use either a molly or a smoke half wall and then they'll use one flash at the start and then they'll hold a second one. So this is essentially the CTs using three grenades for the Tees two. So you'd think the, the T's are still winning the UTO exchange at this portion of the map. However, again, like I mentioned before, it gets very tricky when you take in the context of map control. Because Yekandar is able to push through and get control of the map of Banana, even though they are utilizing more utility, they have the advantage because they have gained control of the map that's very important. The final thing I'm going to touch on is conditioning, and I'm also going to briefly touch on masking as well, but they're essentially the same thing, but they just serve slightly different purposes. Conditioning is essentially what utility you use at the start of each round to create a pattern and to condition your opponent into seeing a similar thing over and over again. Masking is how I'm going to teach you how to use conditioning to make you a better team or a better IGL. Conditioning is essentially you utilizing similar or the exact same grenade 
every single round to prepare the other team to have it be there. For instance, and this is probably the most common at lower levels, is to always, always Molotov halls so people can't come and push for information through boiler or to just jump spot for free and see how many people are alt mid. This is very common in lower levels. You'll see it less and less at higher levels, but that nade is there just about every single round. So you're conditioned not to even bother going for these boiler plays or alt mid jump spots because you're gonna take a lot of damage doing that due to the molly. Another example of this is it's very common to have people Molotov top car. So if you peek from behind car, you're going to be standing in a Molotov. It's, it's very common. This nade usage is conditioning. The repetition of using a nade over and over again to condition the other team to not make certain plays due to the utility you're using at the start of each round. Conditioning can also be used in a more advanced technique. You can condition players to not play certain spots with the util usage that you use. One of the more famous examples of this is using nade stacks and pit. Now, if anybody plays pit, they're getting nade stacked all game, so they're naturally going to lean away from playing this position due to the concern that if they play there, they're just going to instantly die to HE grenades. This is important with banana control as well. If people always jump into this broom and you start nade stacking them there, that changes how they're going to approach banana control because you've conditioned them that coming into this area is not safe because you're going to get double naded. This can start to lead into masking as well. And masking is the true holy grail of conditioning pretty much. Masking is essentially using your conditioning to do alternative things. For instance, the Molotov top car is often used for you to take banana control, right? So I'd say about 90% of the time that you Molotov car, you're utilizing it in a way where you're coming in a banana, gaining control, and going through a standard round. However, if all of a sudden you want to do a halls pop and you don't molly car, that seems suspicious, right? If I'm the banana player and this round they didn't Molotov B at all, I'm going to be a little bit confused if you've done it every other round you go into banana. So you need to mask that you're not in banana and going towards alt mid. So that's where your conditioning comes in. If you have somebody Molotov top car like you've done every other round, you can go halls and the B players don't have their spidey senses tingling because there's no banana molly. Masking can also be done in a way where it's an advanced principle as well. The thing that we talked about with the HE stacks into pit, right? This, if you do this enough, is going to prevent them from playing in pit. But that also means that you're able to utilize strategies that you typically not be able to do because of people being in pit. For instance, uh, popping lane or just contacting up lane is incredibly, incredibly risky because anybody playing inside a pit is going to be able to see you and kill you because he has such a massive advantage in all the angles in pit. However, if they're so afraid of the nade stack in pit, they're not going to play there anymore. They'll probably play on an off angle on Balk or play inside the site. And that allows you to take a more calculated risk and maybe contact Inferno lane and do something really weird like that. I don't recommend contacting Inferno lane. That's like really bad, <laughs> but just as a general example. Anyway, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed the content that I've been putting out. Although it is a bit sporadic, I did need a break after my time at FPX. It was very difficult for me to be waking up at 3.30, 3.45 every morning to be at practice for European time since I stationed or I am stationed in North America. That was very difficult for me, and it kind of burnt me out on content creation for a pretty long time. However, I'm starting to feel the itch again, so hopefully I'll be making more videos soon. As always, if you like this video, like, comment, subscribe to both me and Nart, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.